Good morning. Welcome, Bethel Bible Fellowship. I hope you're awake this morning. This is not an easy passage. Uh, we're going to have to think this morning. Our passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 20 through 25. If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 20. This passage, I'm sure, is one of those passages that Peter was thinking of when he warned people about Paul's writings. Remember in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Peter chapter 3, um, Peter said some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand, and because of that, people twist them and distort them and lead others astray, as they do with the other scriptures. Two interesting things there. One, Peter admits that Paul writes scripture, and two, he admits that scripture is sometimes difficult to understand. And because it's hard to understand, people have a tendency to take what they don't understand and to twist it and distort it and to lead people astray. So as we get ready to look at our passage this morning, I want you to understand there are things in here that are hard to figure out. It's okay. God gave us a brain, so we'll use it. And not everything in the Bible can be sipped through a straw. There are things that he expects us to chew and to digest in order to find the treasure that God has for us. You know, to use a different analogy, if every time you come to the Word of God, all you do is pick the low-hanging fruit, you know, those truths that are obvious and simple, you're going to be missing out on some amazing truth from God's Word, some great treasures. So let's read our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 20. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign for, not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your minds? But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he's convicted by all, and he's called to account by all, and the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God really is among you. Let's pray. Father, as we approach your word, we recognize that it's not just a record of things that were said once or written once, but that it is still living and it's still active, and we ask you to make it so in our hearts, to do a work in our hearts through your word, and, and we believe that you will by faith, as you promise that your word will not return to you empty. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, in this passage, Paul basically is making his case that it's better to prophesy in the assembly of believers than it is to speak in tongues. He basically says to the Corinthian believers, stop being so immature in your thinking. You think tongues are so great. You think tongues are a sign of your spirituality and your spiritual um, prowess. But, Paul says, tongues that nobody understands, not even you yourself, only serve to confuse people and to make them feel unwelcome, to make them feel out of place in your assembly. Prophesying, on the other hand, builds people up and it draws people to the Lord. Now, as we saw last week, Paul spoke in tongues, but apparently not in church. He said in verse 19 of chapter 14, <clears throat> excuse me, I would rather speak five words with my mind and instruct people, build them up, than 10,000 words in a language that nobody can understand. But the Corinthians, they were hung up on this idea that tongues was uh, proof of their spirituality. What they thought proved their spiritual prowess, their spiritual status, was speaking in tongues. If you spoke in tongues, and the more you spoke in tongues, the more spiritual you were. To which Paul says in verse 20, don't be children in your thinking. Or as the NIV says, stop thinking like children. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. The Corinthian believers wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen as important. They were concerned about being recognized and lauded and applauded. To them, church was about coming together and doing spiritual activities together. Spiritual rituals. Religion. 
And they were good at it. A lot of these folks had come to Christ from paganism, from the temple worship, where they were good at doing religion and doing religious things. One of the characteristics of the pagan religions of Paul's day there in Corinth was that these folks uh, would dance and drink in their temples to whatever deity was there. And so as they danced and as they drank, they would whip themselves into a frenzy until the most devoted people in the temple would begin to speak um, what sounded like babbling. And this ecstatic utterance would then be an indication that that, peop- that that person was in a deep spiritual state. Well, apparently, that misuse of the gift of tongues in the church at Corinth stems from this context, this historical context. So the believers in Corinth saw tongues, one, as a sign of spirituality, and two, they associated the gift of tongues with a loss of control. In other words, if you lose control of your tongue, it's proof that God is in control, that that you are under the Spirit's control now. And that connotation of the loss of control is alive and well in a lot of places in Christianity today. People think, oftentimes, that a sign of the Spirit's activity is when you lose control of yourself, like where people fall down, they're slain in the Spirit, right? Or they laugh hysterically or uncontrollably. Or they roll around on the floor out of control. Or they speak in tongues, even in the middle of the church service, even interrupting the sermon. And they say, well, I can't help it because I'm being controlled by the Spirit, He's taken over. My question is, is that really biblical? Not at all. In fact, quite the opposite is true. Losing control of yourself is not an indication of the Spirit's activity in your life. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and Self-control, that's right. And a person who is wholly yielded to the Spirit will have certain evidence in their life of the Spirit. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's right, it's not a lack of control. See, the Spirit doesn't cause us to lose control, but rather He gives us the ability to take control. He gives us the ability to take control of our selfishness and our sinfulness and our flesh to take control of our own lives. That's the evidence of the Spirit. Paul calls it maturity in this passage. So Paul says, stop thinking like children. Grow up. Back in chapter 13, verse 11, do you remember what Paul said? When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, if you remember that, he said that in the context of talking about love. The context of of how useless it is to try to exercise your gift without love. Now, in chapter 14, verse 20, he's speaking specifically about the abuse of the gift of tongues. And he says, you're being childish to the Corinthians. Now, notice, there's a big difference between being childish and being childlike. We are encouraged to be childlike in an unwavering, simple trust in God. Even right here in verse 20, we're told to be infants in evil. That is, we're to guard our innocence when it comes to wickedness. Young people, don't go out looking to be informed about evil. You don't need to know the details. God calls it evil, that's good. You don't have to do any research on it. It's good to be childlike in that way. But there is a problem with being childish. That is, being self-centered and self-absorbed and carnal. Instead, Paul says the goal is maturity. Paul says, in your thinking, be mature. There's a whole sermon right there. I wish we could preach it. Don't have time. But we'll come back to that idea of maturity. But if you remember from last week... One of the goals of love in a church fellowship is to make people feel at home. If you remember what Joel was talking about last week. And tongues can hamper that. It can hinder our goal. In verse 11, Paul said, If I don't know the meaning of the language that's being spoken, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. 
That's not love. And that can't build relationships. Now in verse 21, Paul's going to expound on that idea. And he uses the Old Testament to do it. In verse 21 he says, In the law it is written, By people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. Talking to the Jewish people in the Old Testament. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. Well, that sounds clear enough, right? Verse 22. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers, and prophesy, prophesying is a sign for believers. Look at it in your Bible. Go ahead and look at it. Verse 22. It's really important that we see this. Because things are about to get really weird in what Paul says. Very illogical. Verse 22 again. Tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. So, get it down. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers. And prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. So, prophecy is a sign for believers. Now, as clear as that sounds, Paul now proceeds to give two examples in the next couple of verses that seem to completely contradict what he just said. In fact, some people have used this passage to say that's proof that this is not the Word of God. God would not have given, given us something that is so confusing. And other people, down through the ages, have actually taken it upon themselves to rearrange the words in verse 22. So it sounds more logical to our human ears. In other words, they twist what is hard to understand. In verse 22, it says, Tongues are a sign for unbelievers. But now look at verse 23. It says, Now, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are crazy? So if somebody doesn't know much about Christianity, if they're uninformed about Christianity or, or just a complete unbeliever, and they come into your church and everybody in the church is speaking in tongues, Paul says it's not going to draw them to Christ. They're going to fill out a place. They're going to feel unwelcome and they're going to conclude that you're all nuts. And they're going to run. Now that doesn't sound like a sign to unbelievers to me. Quite the opposite. Now, remember, the, the kind of tongues that we saw in the book of Acts in chapter 2, 10, and 19 that we looked at last week, those did work this way. Those were assigned to unbelievers, and unbelievers got saved when people, the disciples, were speaking in tongues on the streets of Jerusalem at Pentecost and in those other two places that are mentioned. Either they got saved or they were drawn into fellowship. They were already saved, but they got drawn into the fellowship. But that's a different kind of tongue. The tongue, clearly, that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 12, is the kind of private prayer language to God type of tongues. And he says that the confusion that those kinds of tongues can cause in a local fellowship and the, dis the disruptive nature of those kind of tongues makes it think that when people come into your fellowship that you're nuts, that you're crazy. It's not helpful. They feel unwelcome and out of place. Now, I can attest to this firsthand. When I was in probably about mid-school, our next-door neighbors, they were the Browns, um, very outspoken Christian family. They invited our family, a very quiet Catholic family, to a dinner, a supper with them. It was going to be in Santa Fe, um, so we had to drive to get there, and, and we went down in separate cars, but we met the Browns there, and we went in, and there was a special speaker. It was some kind of fundraiser. I don't remember what the cause was, but the speaker got up, and he spoke, and when he was done and he sat down, there was a worship time, and people all over the conference hall began to speak in tongues in this worship time. And I don't mean everybody was, but all around me. I'm a mid-school kid. And people are speaking in tongues, their eyes are closed, their hands are in the air, some people are on the floor. I was freaked out. I had no idea what was going on. I was scared. I really was. I'd never seen anything like this. I'd grown up in northern New Mexico in a Catholic church. You know everything that's about to happen. Everything is very orderly and liturgical and, and predictable. And suddenly I'm surrounded by people speaking in tongues everywhere. Well, my dad took my mom's hand and he looked at me and my brother, and he nodded, and we got out. We left. And I remember on the drive back home, I remember my parents laughing and making fun of those crazy people. 
And I remember a few years later when one of my best friends got saved and he started witnessing to me. And I remember thinking, I don't want this. I don't want to be like those crazy people at that dinner that night. And that experience at that dinner where everybody's speaking in tongues in a very real sense caused me to keep the gospel at arm's length and to keep God's people at arm's length. I was convinced that if I gave my life to Jesus like my friend was telling me to do, Jesus was going to want me to be like those people and I was going to have to do that kind of thing. And it seemed crazy to me. and It didn't seem reasonable. Little did I know that according to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23, I was right. The abuse of the gift did work to keep me away from the gospel and to keep me from taking the gospel seriously. So, again, I ask, why does Paul say in verse 22 that tongues are a sign for unbelievers? Didn't feel like a sign for me. Quite the opposite. Made me run. Well, the answer is found in the context. Imagine that. And not just the immediate context, but but the context of the entire scripture. Paul quoted a passage from the Old Testament. Verse 21. And that verse, that passage, holds the answer to our problem. Paul quoted from Isaiah 28, if you want to turn there. Isaiah 28, he loosely quoted verses 11 and 12. Now, before we begin reading there, I need to let you know, Isaiah here is... is, um, pronouncing a judgment on Israel. The priests and the prophets had forgotten God. They had led the entire nation astray from God. And here, God, the God who had promised them rest was now promising them judgment, the lack of rest. But the unbelieving Jews, they mocked Isaiah. They made fun of him. And so God inspires Isaiah to pronounce this judgment on Israel. Let's start reading in verse 7. Isaiah 21, verse 7. It says, These also reel with wine and stagger with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink and they are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision and they stumble in giving judgment. They can't do what I sent them to do because they're attached to the bottle. Verse 8. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. There's a lovely vision. See, the Jews had replaced the counsel of God and the grace of God for wine and drunkenness. And in verse 9, Isaiah quotes them. He quotes the priests and the people who were mocking Isaiah. That's why there's quotation marks around verses 9 and 10. It says, so this is, this is, the, is, this is the Israelites speaking to Isaiah or about Isaiah. To whom will he teach knowledge? To whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those who are taken from the breast. In other words, who's this Isaiah guy talking to? He treats us like we're a bunch of kids. He keeps saying the same things over again, line upon line, precept upon precept. He keeps repeating it over and over again. Israel found Isaiah's teaching to be beneath them. Verse 10. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. They're scoffing Isaiah, saying that his teaching is elementary. He's like a a, a person teaching little kids a line here and a line there, learning their letters, learning their numbers. It's nothing new. It's just elementary building blocks of the Bible. It's boring is what they're saying. He's just up there babbling. They wanted their ears tickled, and they wanted something sensational from Isaiah. And all Isaiah would do is faithfully teach the word of God to them. And they weren't satisfied with it, and so they mocked him. Now, the Hebrew of verse 10 is really fascinating. In English, it says precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. When you read it in the Hebrew, it actually sounds like babbling. In Hebrew, it says tzav la tzav, tzav la tzav, kav la kav, kav la kav. This is what the people were saying to Isaiah when he tried to teach them. They were mocking him, and they were scoffing, and they were making these babbling noises to him as though to say, you know, what you have to say to us is nothing. So God pronounces his judgment in verse 11. And this is the part that's quoted in 1 Corinthians. He says, For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to his people. To whom he has said, this rest 
This is rest. Give rest to the weary. And this is repose. God's offering them rest. He's offering them grace. And they wouldn't take it. It says, yet they would not hear. Verse 13. And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. He's going to bring their mocking and he's going to bring it down on their heads. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little. There a little. That they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Taken. Yeah, taken into captivity. See, if you go back further into Isaiah chapter 7, you find out that what God's talking about here is the nation of Assyria. God is raising up the nation of Assyria. He made them prosper for 100 years for one purpose, to bring them as a war club, that's his word, against the nation of Israel who had become unbelieving Israel and had departed from God. And he was going to bring this people of strange tongue against the Israelites in judgment for their disbelief and their disobedience. God's warning the unbelieving Israelites here that the next words that they're going to hear from him are going to be the words of Assyrian soldiers who are coming to wreak destruction on their heads as his judgment. So when Paul quotes Isaiah 28 to the Corinthians, he's reminding them that when God speaks in languages that you don't understand, it's a sign. But it's a sign of judgment. The Israelites were going to be surrounded by the Assyrians, speaking a language they couldn't understand, and they were going to feel like strangers in their own land. And this is the parallel that Paul's drawing to our passage, and it happened. In 722 B.C., the nation of Assyria eventually worked their way, conquering nations until they got to Israel, and they defeated Israel, the northern kingdom. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14.21, God equates the foreign tongues of Isaiah 28 to the foreign tongues of the problem in Corinth. So in verse 22, he says, thus, tongues are a sign for unbelievers. But it's a negative sign. It's a sign of judgment. Just as the foreign language of the Assyrians drove unbelieving Israel from the goodness of God and from the grace of God, so also foreign languages, if that is the main characteristic of your worship in your church, then it's going to drive unbelievers away from you. And it's going to drive unbelievers away from the goodness and away from the grace of God. And they're going to go away thinking that you're crazy, that you've all gone nuts. But, he says in verse 24, if all prophesy, so now he's comparing, if everyone was speaking in tongues, it would drive people out. But, if all prophesy, and an unbeliever outsider enters, he's convicted by all, and he's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God really is among you. So, prophecy works as a sign to believers when we see, through the gifts that God gave us, the unsaved being saved. The important point to notice here is that Paul is drawing a drastic contrast between tongues and and prophecy. Tongues, he says, serve to alienate people. Prophecy builds relationship and draws people in. Tongues are a sign of judgment. Prophecy is a sign of God's grace. Now again, Paul's not saying that, that tongues are bad when used in private or when they're used with interpretation. But when they're used in a way that is confusing and disruptive, he says it's wrong and it's childish. It causes people to feel out of place. It causes people to feel unwelcome. They think, they're going to think you're crazy. And when you do that, it's childish, and it's selfish, and it's not loving. Now, look at the result of the two gifts. The misuse of tongues, when people abuse tongues like they were in Corinth, it drives unbelievers away from the church. The gift of prophecy draws them in. Look at the very end of verse 25. It says, the unbeliever will worship God and declare that God really is among you. The gift causes people to recognize that God is in your midst. He's with you. So let me ask a question. Do people recognize that God is with you? That God's in your life? In your home? In our church? The Corinthians were misusing the gift of tongues 
in order to impress people. Paul wants us to see that the goal is to make people feel at home. People don't want to be impressed. They're not looking to be impressed by your gift. They're looking for a home, a place to fit in, a place they can call their church home. And Paul says our job as believers is to make, help them feel at home. Now, according to Paul, that takes mature thinking. Verse 20. The Corinthians were being childish when they used their gifts to try to impress people. They wanted to be seen for what the gift was doing. They wanted others to think that they were super spiritual. Paul says, be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Now, the last time Paul talked about being childish was in 1 Corinthians 13, like we already saw. In that passage, 1 Corinthians 13, what is the opposite of childishness? What's the whole chapter about? It's about love. That's right. Isn't that cool? According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the opposite of childishness is love. By the time he gets to 14, the opposite of childishness is maturity in Christ. He's equating maturity in Christ with love. So we could say, this is a description of Christian maturity. That maturity is patient and kind and it doesn't envy or boast, and it's not arrogant or rude, and it doesn't insist on its own way, and it's not irritable or resentful, all of those things. That's what a mature believer looks like. That's living in love. The Corinthians thought that their gift was going to make them look spiritual. Paul says, no, the mark of true spirituality is your maturity in Christ, walking in mature love, the love of God. The real evidence of the Holy Spirit is that he's active in your life and that his characteristics are starting to live themselves through your life. It's what we call the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. So the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life is not your gift. It's his fruit, love, and joy. Even in our upheaval of our day, and the weird culture that we live in now, and the weird political scene. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. And self-control. If those things are yours and they're growing in your life, then people will see that God is with you, and they'll be drawn to him. Again, it's worth repeating. We've said it many times. Your gifts are not for you. Your gifts are intended to build others up toward maturity in Christ. That's why God gave you the gift, whatever your gifts are. If you would, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll finish with this. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 4. I think we have to be very careful constantly to remind ourselves that our purpose on this earth is to glorify God by building people up, by building into their lives. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul writes, And he, God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. He gave these gifts for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the full measure of the stature of Christ so that we may no longer be children. Notice the parallel between this passage and our passage this morning. So that we may no longer be children, childish, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint and with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You see, your goal on this earth is not to feel happy or to feel safe or to feel secure or to feel fulfilled or anything else that your culture tells you your purpose is. Those things will come. They're not unimportant. They will come when you pursue your purpose in life as a Christian, which is 
to build others up in Christ, to build people up toward maturity in Christ. That's where you will find that peace and that security and that fulfillment and that blessedness and that happiness. Reminds me of Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. If Paul had a theme verse, I think it would have been Colossians 1, 28. Paul said, him we proclaim, Christ. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That was Paul's goal. That was what he lived for, that he could build into others people, other people's lives so that they would reach maturity in Christ. And he worked at it with every ounce of energy. In 1 Corinthians 1.29, the very next verse, he says, for this I toil, striving with all the energy that he so mightily inspires within me. Every ounce of energy I have, Paul said, I spend to build people up toward maturity in Christ. What a purpose for us on this earth. And that's what love is, and that's what maturity is. To take our eyes off ourselves to put our eyes on each other so that we're building each other up in the faith and in love. May God make it so. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We recognize that your activity in our lives is often quiet and mundane, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And yet it's consistent and it's faithful. We look for the spectacular and you breed the faithful and the persistent. We ask you to do that in our lives. Lord, we invite you to remain persistent as you defeat our childishness and you build maturity into us. And Lord, we ask for those gifts to be evident so that we might be building each other up. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Can you stand with us?